I think for purposes of time, we might have to go to the next presenter and then come back to Dr. Olive when she's back. Adia, are you ready for this presentation? Yes. yes, Dr. Richard, I am. Do you want me to share the screen or you can? I can share it. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Adia Kajimu Katumba, and I'm going to give a presentation with Professor Kawoya on behalf of EQRA, and I'm going to be talking about the EQRA experience and impact of training midwives with essential obstetric ultrasound skills for routine use in antenatal care, as well as opportunities for scale up, especially in rural Uganda. Um, the objectives of this talk, we'll just have a brief look at the background, the training, how ICRI has impacted with maternal health, uh, as well as um, ultrasound community activities, then the conclusion and the opportunities of scale. Ekire in full is Ernest Cook Ultrasound Research and Education Institute that was launched on the 20th of June 2002 by His Excellency the President. It was named after Dr. Ernest Cook, who was the nephew of Sir Albert Cook, who we all know brought the first X-ray machine into Uganda. And in collaboration with Professor Barry B. Goldberg of Thomas Jefferson University, USA, he supported the beginning of Ekure as an affiliate ultrasound training center that teaches an ordinary diploma in ultrasound in, aff in affiliation with Thomas Jefferson University. Ekure's vision is to be an example of excellence in health training, research, and service delivery. And its mission is to provide outstanding healthcare training and quality research driven medical services on the African continent. We're going to look at the training at EQRA. Um, training programs at EQRA, which include obstetric ultrasound, we train um, midwives, nurses, uh, radiographers, doctors. So um, midwives can get a certificate in limited obstetric ultrasound for six weeks. Then we also have uh, an ordinary diploma in diagnostic ultrasound, which is a, a post-basic diploma that lasts six months. Then we have a bachelor's in diagnostic ultrasound, which lasts three years, as well as a master's in diagnostic ultrasound, which lasts two years. These are some of the images showing um, EQRA specialists teaching students hands-on ultrasound, um, especially the obstetric patients. We have in total over 35 ultrasound machines and uh, we have about 20 in the skills lab because the patient, the student number keeps on growing. Um, from 2002, from the inception of Ecure to 2019, we've had a total of about 1,638 students and um, these ones have come from Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Zambia, as well as um, Western Africa like Nigeria, Ghana, um, we've had from Southern Africa, Zimbabwe, as well as uh, Namibia and Malawi. We've had from as far as UK, as well as India and Yemen. Just, that's just to mention that a few. So you see that the, the diversity of students is really wide. This is just a, a summary showing the districts in Uganda where the EQRA trainees and graduates come from. And this is just a summary with the African countries. 
from where Ekure students come from. Now, how has Ekure impacted maternal health in Uganda? Ekure has, um, has worked on numerous projects involving obstetrics ultrasound. The most um, popular one, I think, which very many have heard of is the ORET project, which took place from 2007 to 2011. Then we had the Mount Strides project, which took place in 2011. Then we had the RAD Impact project from 2016 to 2018. And then recently in 2018, we had the Uganda Reproductive Maternal and Child Health Services Improvement Project. Now, I'm going to talk about the ORET project first, which was a joint project from the Uganda government and the government of the Netherlands. Um, it was in affiliation with Pontes University of the Netherlands. It involved equipment donation to 70 health units, mostly health center fours and a general hospital. There were 200 rural health workers, mostly midwives, from 70 health facilities who were trained to perform obstetrical ultrasound, then redeployed back into their health facilities. Or it, uh, the objective of ORIT was to use limited obstetrics ultrasound as a means of reducing maternal mortality rates in remote locations. Participants who came trained from all districts of Uganda and the training consisted of six modules spread out over a year. The ORET program raised the level of awareness for ultrasound and this attracted and motivated the participants to enroll for longer formal courses in ultrasound. So what happened to the ORET graduates? As you can see, the majority of the graduates are still in their workstations, that's about 71.2%. But about 28.8% are no longer in their workstations for a variety of reasons. Um, most of them were transferred by district officials or the Ministry of Health. Then a few undertook other studies, a few retired. Um, one, again, um, left for political reasons. Another one requested for transfer. And others had other reasons. Now we're going to look at the Mouth Strides project. Um, the objective of the Mouth Strides project was to improve reproductive health indicators and lower maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality through the use of solar powered portable ultrasound technology. The aim of this project was to harness advancements in ultrasound technology and enhance clinical skills of rural midwives build demand for the reproductive health services at health centers and strengthen the linkage between community and health facility, as well as expand the access to reproductive health and child survival services. It was implemented in rural PG. Ekure was involved by installing 112 portable solar powered ultrasound machines in 112 health facilities. And it trained 110 midwives in limited obstetric ultrasound scanning, as well as equipment maintenance. There was an extension of this project that was awarded to Ekure with the help of USAID and through Strides for, health, Strides for Family Health projects. And the districts where this project was implemented were Mitiana, Kaliro, Kamuli, Zembabule, all those which are mentioned there were involved in this project. So this is just a photo of, um, of how Professor Kawea, as you can see him here, he went and did some support supervision to see how the midwives in the periphery were performing following the basic obstetrics ultrasound training. Then we look at the RAD Impact Project. RAD Impact is a non-profit organization whose main objective is to lower maternal mortality by increasing the access to medical imaging in rural communities. In 2016 to 2018, RAD Impact um, partnered with Ecure to train midwives in limited obstetrical ultrasound and in the Helping Babies Survive project. Um, Ecure trained a total of 36 midwives, nurses, and clinical officers. Midwives were trained from these 12 rural districts. You can see we have um, some districts in the north of Uganda those coming from Wakiso, those coming from Rukunjiri and the southwestern Uganda. Then we also have those ones coming from eastern Uganda as well as central Uganda. 
Red Impact was uh, very helpful because it also donated ultrasound machines to prenatal clinics in each of these facilities. One midwife from each of these 12 clinics came to a six-week training at Ecure from in January 2016 to learn how to use ultrasound to make basic obstetric diagnosis. With the Uganda Reproductive Maternal and Child Health Services Improvement Project, the Ministry of Health awarded 122 students scholarships to train government health workers in diagnostic ultrasound. We had the highest number of students who were 65. Then medical radiology had 30 and cold chain technology had 27. The essence was to improve skills in reproductive maternal, neonatal child and adolescent health services. And this was funded by the World Bank. Ecure has also been involved in numerous obstetrics ultrasound community activities and it has had extensive outreach activities to rural communities, training rural midwives in basic ultrasound. I have to emphasize that it's limited basic obstetric ultrasound. We tell the midwives to always refer the more difficult cases to a regional referral hospital. So this is an ultrasound outreach to Kavale. You can again see um, we are very much involved with um, scanning the patient. We also have held health camps in Kampala with free ultrasound and maternal health services. And we were organizing one for this year, but unfortunately we were interrupted by the COVID pandemic. Ecure also provides a corporate social responsibility by giving free ultrasound scanning services to teenage girls with crisis pregnancy under the Wakisa Ministries. Um, then we're going to look at a few research projects in which we've been involved in that involve obstetrics ultrasound. Um, there, were, there was a, a paper that was published by Professor Michael, which looked at the impact of introducing routine antenatal ultrasound services and reproductive health indicators in PG district. From this paper, um, we found, they found that there was an increase in up to 32% in the first ANC attendance at the intervention compared to 7.4 in controls. Then there was an increase in the fourth ANC attendance to 147% compared to 0.6% decline in the control. Then there was an increase in referrals of high-risk pregnancies that was by 40.7% in the intervention sites compared with 25% in the control site. Then there was an increase of births at the interventional site as well. So from this study, the conclusion was that the integration of limited obstetric ultrasound into routine ANC visits is associated with an increase in antenatal attendance. We also saw that ultrasound ANC is associated with increased uptake of ancillary treatment. And you find that these ladies who come for the ANC, ANC they can get other ancillary benefits such as um, anemia treatments as well as deworming treatments. This was also published in um, the BMC Pregnancy Child Birth Journal. It was another paper that was co-written by Professor Michael Kawoya. So from these projects, we've had numerous success stories. Um, one of the most interesting is that we've seen an observed increase in male attendance with ANC. We know that um, very many males do not like going for antenatal with their wives. And um, it's common knowledge that whenever a man comes with his wife for antenatal, she's given first priority. So this was a couple that came for ANC at about 32 weeks. The lady was carrying twins, but unfortunately one of the twins had an IUFD and the other twin was still alive. So they kept on, when the father came to see um, his child on the ultrasound machine, he saw how the heart was beating for one child and how the heart was not beating for the other child. So he was very concerned and he remained by his wife's side throughout the entire process until she delivered the baby and as well as the macerated fetus, the macerated steel bath. So um, after delivery, um, fortunately, 
this was the, the baby who survived, who was Zavidia, who came out first. She survived and follow up after six months. We find that there she is very happy at six months. And this was um, the patient with his husband, with her husband. And she commented that had it not been for the scan and the medical care offered to us at PGS Health Center 4, they would have lost both babies. But she was also very thankful for her husband's support during that time because it meant a lot and strengthened their relationship. Because the husband was provided psychosocial support as well as as well as financial support. So in the to conclude um, with this presentation, ACRA has trained over 1,000 midwives and other health workers in obstetrics ultrasound from several districts in Uganda at certificate, diploma, and degree level. If we have integrated, it's also important to integrate obstetrics ultrasound in antenatal care, and we found that this one has an associated increase of antenatal care attendance. We've also seen that integrating obstetrics ultrasound in antenatal care is associated with an increased number of women receiving ancillary benefits of ANC, like anemia and deworming treatment. And also we've seen that integrating ultrasound in ANC could lead to more active involvement and support by the male spouse. Um, for the opportunities of scale, I um, would like to request for grants from the Uganda government and Ministry of Health, as well as international aid to equip midwives with the skills for performing obstetric ultrasound through a certificate or diploma course in ultrasound. These ones can later upgrade to sonographers after undertaking the bachelor's degree in ultrasound. Currently, sonographers are not recognized in the Ministry of Health scheme of service. So we are also requesting that the government um, should recognize sonographers as degree holding um, um, graduates in ultrasound. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that's the end of the presentation. Yes, I hand over back to you, Dr. Richard. Thank you very much, uh, dear, for the presentation. Uh, Dr. Waswa, I could take over. Thank you very much. I'm actually using a phone and a the computer. Uh, Dr. Sentumbe, are you on? Dr. Sentumbe, are you on? Um, seems we don't have Dr. Sin. Yes, on the... yes, I am on. Thank you. Oh, wonderful, Dr. Sin. Please. <laughs> yes. Okay, I you my... with the network, but now that you are with us, please uh, share with us your presentations. Your okay. presentation and go forward. Thank you. Okay, as I said that our, in, our presentation was going to cover some introductory remarks, uh, how the NC guidelines were developed, some recommendations, we'll do some highlights which need to be noted, and probably suggest that uh, our implementation should also have some research and a critical amount of uh, monitoring and evaluating what we are doing. So why are we really looking at this critically today? Essentially, we must know that uh, ANC is an important pillar for safety of mothers. And if we do evidence-based actions related to health promotion, disease prevention, screening and treatment, the women are likely to have reduced complications of pregnancy and childbirth we will also be able to reduce stillbirths and perinatal deaths, but we must be able to offer this within an integrated care delivery system throughout ANC. The recommendations being made in 2016 are dependent on the high work that has been done with the four visits, which we have been knowing as focused ANC. 
and which is part and parcel of the so many documents which you know, which are related to part of pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum, and newborn care, the WHO guidelines. It's a series of them. But antenatal is a very important guidance also. And through this implementation, uh, there was need to continue to understand how else can we offer a better quality of ANC. So WHO went ahead to do a lot of understanding from what women prioritize, what are women's voices, what do they want, need, value in ANC, what are the women's views and experiences of using ANC services, but what do the health workers also say? Okay. So, uh, it is... all right. I don't know whether we can mute our colleagues. Otherwise, we are envisaging a pregnancy where every pregnant woman and child birth and newborn receives quality care throughout pregnancy, childbirth, and postnatal period. As you know, we are now talking about quality of care throughout the continent. And now, today we are discussing ANC. Because we know that if we prioritize this person-centered health and well-being, we will reduce mortality. We shall provide respect to care to the women. And of course, we will be optimizing service delivery within the health system. So, the 2016 guidelines uh, address a core package of ONC guidelines and to all pregnant women and adolescents who should really receive the total content of the model package, are the questions we ask, who provides care, where is the care provided, how is the care being provided? Those are important questions in the way we offer health uh, ANC services, and this takes into context the different countries where they are and what they are able to provide in terms of who is offering, how do they offer. You will realize that uh, these guidelines are also evidence-based. A lot of research has been done. And then we discuss also under these guidelines, who should be providing these practices? How should they be delivered? Uh, the women's views that were looked at related to the fact that uh, women really, what they called a positive pregnancy experience from NC, is us being able to deliver them uh, throughout their pregnancy being healthy, with their mothers, we should be able to prevent and treat risks if they occur. Uh, we should also be able to have, uh, to reduce illness and death amongst pregnant women. The women also said that they really wanted physical and social cultural normality during pregnancy, not to be treated as though they have a very medical issue. They also wanted to make sure that they are transiting from a positive pregnancy to a positive labor and birth. And of course, after that, they thought that they should have positive motherhood if everything goes well. So briefly, this development of guidelines uh, was done through a number of uh, centers and a lot of research-related uh, recommendations were brought on board and considered within the WHO grading. We will quickly go through the recommendations and will not go through into the steps of grading and how each recommendation is graded. Otherwise, in a summary, the recommendations which are going to be shown briefly, they have either being recommended completely, but for all women. But there are also those where the options are under only context of rigorous research. You don't apply the recommendation to everybody. 
or the, it is a recommendation which can only be implemented when it is being properly targeted, monitored, and evaluated. And other recommendations are under only specific contexts because of, you know, where you, the country is or what it has. And some of them, because they were under research, were found not to be positive or coming with good results. And so those will definitely show we do not recommend this option. So there are 49 recommendations, 14 are nutritional, eight are maternal and fetal assessment, five are about preventive measures, and um, six are about interventions for common physiological symptoms, which are very common, and uh, six are about the health systems interventions, which we should do to improve the utilization and quality of ANC. And there are 10 routine ANC recommendations from other WHO guidelines apart from the research that was done. So what are these recommendations? And uh, how are they being uh, implemented? When are they being implemented? And why the new word contact instead of ANC visits? Uh, some of the new things which we shall be discussing is early ultrasound and thank God that uh, presentation has been done before 24 weeks is certain recommendations that we, we are going to come up with. And uh, these guidelines also really uh, prioritize health systems approach strengthening. Because if we don't ensure continuity of care or integrated services, if we don't improve communication, which is a standard really, if we don't have empowered health workers, if we are not able to recruit and retain health workers, especially in the rural and remote areas, if we are not able to do capacity building, if we have no supplies, commodities and data monitoring, we may not be able to really implement the services as ex the recommendations as expected and get out what we expect. So we shall only look at the red ones which are being recommended, but since the presentation will be given to you, you can go through the rest which you have heard of. So for instance, in nutrition, uh, it's recommended that counseling about healthy eating and keeping physically active during pregnancy is recommended for pregnant women to stay healthy and prevent excessive weight gain. So that's evidence-based. And then another one is uh, the daily, which we have always known, oral iron and folic acid supplementation. With 30 milligrams to eat can range anything, 30 milligrams to 60 milligrams of elemental iron and the 400 micrograms of folic acid. Then in nutritional intervention supplements, not much was really found very effective, except when you have specific conditions existing in a particular country where some things are missing. So the next ones relate to maternal assessment. Again, even for maternal assessment, they are context specific, depending on what you have. Who, which patient have you got? For instance, we must do full blood count testing, which is recommended as a method for diagnosing anemia in pregnancy. But given the settings where full blood count is not possible, not available, at least you do on-site hemoglobin testing with a hemoglobinometer. In regard to where you suspect midstream urine, uh, midstream urine culture is recommended, method for diagnosing asymptomatic bacteria in pregnancy. So in settings where urine culture is not available, on-site mainstream urine not available, then we, uh, we, we do on-site midstream uh, gram staining, which is recommended over the use of the dipstick, which uh, has been one of the common methods. Then there is also another recommendation coming up and in Uganda, I think they are trying to do it well, is the clinical inquiry about the possibility of intimate partner violence. This is strongly recommended, especially in our countries where violence against women 
especially during pregnancy, has been proven to be really high. So a country like ours can do that. Then we look at the hyperglycemia, which is first detected in pregnancy, should really be classified as gestational diabetes or diabetes mellitus in pregnancy, as you know, and you have to follow it up. Where there's tobacco uh, and uh, alcohol and other substances, we must really detect that. So we must find out whether women are doing this because it's going to affect their newborns, both the alcoholic syndrome and the vessels up there with the tobacco. Of course, for Uganda, B1.7, which is the high prevalency settings with HIV, we are definitely doing the, 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 the provider-initiated testing and counseling. And also, we know now that we must integrate the syphilis testing. All other tests which are coming up, as you know, which are affecting us, like hepatitis, which are affecting the child and the child. In Uganda, for instance, TB, uh, well, it is said that where, where countries have prevalences more than 100 per 100,000 population, we should be screening for TB. And Uganda is apparently at 183 per 100,000. So definitely Uganda should be taking on a, a routine screening for tuberculosis. We look at the fit assessment and most of them are context specific, except the one where we were introduced to that one ultrasound can, before, can be done before 20 weeks of gestation. This is what is called the early ultrasound, which is recommended to ensure that we estimate gestational age, improve detection of fit anomalies and multiple pregnancies are also diagnosed. It reduces induction of labor for postpartum pregnancy, and it improves as you had a woman's pregnancy. In regard to preventive measures, a seven day antibiotic regimen is recommended if you have this asymptomatic bacteria. And definitely for our environment, Uganda, this is a, a common problem. We also have tetanus, and uh, diphtheria. So what is happening is that um, now we have moved on from TT to TD. The others, preventive measures like uh, malaria endemic countries, that is Uganda, we are doing IPTP. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have started the oral pre exposure prophylaxis with Teneva. If we have such patients who are likely to have a high risk in pregnancy. General population, yes. And of course, we look quickly look at the common physiological symptoms. We know nausea is, and uh, we can have quickly many options like ginger, chamomile, vitamin B6, and its other mixtures to reduce this. There's a heart burn also which is usually um, found in women and definitely anti-acid preparations can be given. Magnesium, calcium or non-pharmacological treatment can also be offered for the cramps, which are very common. There's sometimes low back pain and pelvic pain. These have been found to be uh, benefiting from physiotherapy, support belts and acupuncture where these are available. While if you have constipation, a wheat bran or other fiber supplements, of course, wheat bran, as you realize, is not Uganda. But in our guidelines, you shall see what we have recommended for constipation. Our normal bananas, what not, um, uh, popos, cabbages. So when we uh, adapted these guidelines, most of these recommendations we put there what Uganda has. Then there are those issues of varicose veins and edema where we can have compression stockings if we have them and leg elevation, water immersion, depending on what the pregnant woman has. 
uh, in order for us to be good, doing good at dental care, it is recommended that each pregnant woman carries her own case notes. And for Uganda, definitely we have the antenatal card and uh, the passport, the NC passport, not the other passport. Well, there are also these community mobilization through facilitated, which are context specific and Uganda has been doing some of that. And also mobilizing women at community for ANC visits at their homes, but also in the community that we have also taken on in some districts. And so some of them are really based on what is your context and you can do. Otherwise, in regard for the health systems, some of the things which we are now considering seriously to ensure that NC is offered, especially under some of the circumstances we have, is tax shifting, uh, the promotion of health related behaviors for maternal and newborn health to a broader range of cadres, you know, including lay health workers, auxiliary nurses, and midwives, doctors, so that they can get fully exposed according to what combination of cadres they have. But we can also do task shifting in the distribution of recommended nutritional supplements and intermittent preventive treatment in pregnancy. Anybody can, if trained, including the auxiliary nurses, nurses, midwives, doctors, any of them can pick and really offer this, given who you have. I mean, if your clinic is only doctors, I don't know if they're like that, it's okay. And then, of course, the major new thing is that the ANC visits in the past, which we are recommended for, the language has turned to contacts. We shall learn that contacts sort of emphasizes the fact that this person has interfaced with the the health worker and under integrated good ANC care, she has been assessed and managed. Other than a visit, which could have been, hey, you visited and you have got your antenatal card. So, what is new in there? Basically, uh, we really want to emphasize all those others, but uh, mainly indicate that more contacts between pregnant women and respectful, knowledgeable healthcare providers are more likely to lead to a positive pregnancy experience. So more contacts than the four, which we all knew. And when are these four contacts, eight contacts? You see, contact one, is up to 12 weeks, before 12 weeks. Contact two, 20 weeks. Contact three, 26. And the others fall like that, four, five, six, seven, eight. And to me, the interesting thing was that if you look at this, this is the old ANC before even the four ANC visits. And the mother's advice to return for delivery at 41 weeks, if not birth has been given. So we've already discussed the visit versus the, the, the contact, what it takes into system. So I think we can go from that. And uh, definitely the specific content before the ultrasound before 24 weeks gestation is being used to estimate gestational age, detect food abnormalities and enhance, and enhance the maternal pregnancy experience. That is its importance. So how do we go about implementation? That is the question most people have. We must revise what we have had. Uh, and it was for to make sure that the human resource considerations are being made. We probably need more people on the job. We need to revise the ANC strategy which we had before, and that one Uganda has 
least done. We need to consider what we have to do at the district level, like supporting capacity building for health workers, including community health workers, making sure that the district leadership is providing regular supportive supervision, is overseeing stock of commodities, and is promoting ANC delivery and uh, utilization for decision making at facility level. Uh, we must consider other things also at the district level. Monitoring priority national health indicators, supporting quality of care, harmonizing and coordinating partners and promoting opportunities for learning. But we must also look at what should happen at the health facility level. We must apply those updated guidelines, reorganize services, integrate all those recommended interventions, and ensure that there is regular provider support, clinical coaching, mentoring, and so on, as we all know in Uganda. We must update and maintain commodity systems. We must introduce, strengthen, establish quality improvement assurance practices and initiatives. We must regularly collect data and assess client satisfaction. That must be now become part and parcel of us. At the community, we must go out to sensitize them and undertake community sensitization of various activities and build capacity for community health workers to be able to, you know, advocate for NC. And therefore, we need to strengthen the links between our health facilities and communities. How can we measure what we are doing their output outcome indicators you know we want to see that pregnant women who began ANC during the first trimester who, how many what is the percentage and they showed us that uh, the percentage can actually increase if you do this uh, evidence-based quality ANC so that one has even been proven we also want to look at what is the percentage of pregnant women providing iron and folic acid? I guess you know what it is for now. Pregnant women who received at least the TD doses, initially it was TT for many countries. Pregnant women with at least four, now they are eight. We have to go up to eight, uh, you know? Pregnant women who received counseling on danger signs. Pregnant women with their blood pressure measured during ANC. Health workers, density and distribution. Health units, at least one service provider trained. Then outputs, pregnant women counseled for HIV and other results, which, as we shall see. And of course, we want to see women who receive anti ailments, uh, SP or IPT for our case, and where there are issues of HIV risk maybe or prep. We must encourage a lot of research, implementation research, and we must really monitor what we are doing. Uh, throughout this implementation, we need to adapt according to what we have. And we can make sure that the basic routine indicators as provided up there are being implemented. But we must, as we go along also, create some priority research questions so that we are able to do things for ourselves. And of course, as Ban Ki-moon said, to achieve every woman, every child vision and the global strategy, which you all know about women, children and adolescents, we need innovative evidence-based approaches to antenatal care. It's not going to be easy to have a one, you know, fits all. So he said he welcomed these guidelines which aim to put women at the center because as I said in the beginning, these guidelines were based on what women said they wanted so that they have this in a, uh, enhancing their experience of pregnancy and ensuring that babies have the best possible start in life. So we will provide you with a number of links to show you some infographics, for instance, and this uh, reference is known, you can visit. And sometimes 
countries have adopted them so that they can also have similar simplified uh, things for which communities can easily understand. Otherwise, uh, these are the relevant links. There is a lot of reading stuff, but we need to simplify what we are exactly going to do uh, by countries, for instance, identifying what the content of their eight contact goal-oriented ANs is going to be. And we are glad to say that Uganda has done that. So we have a goal-oriented protocol now, which is eight contacts with some of those basic things which we have shown in the presentation. So we are not uh, doing badly and we need to, I think, just continue to implement and come out results and improve as we go. But we have the basics that it takes us to implement what is new. And so we really want to thank the trainers, the QA course, and uh, Mengo in particular, which has started making sure that there is capacity building for the health workers in accordance with the, some of the new recommendations. And of course, to all of you who are doing excellent work, you know, the districts, uh, there is no district without NC under the current difficulties. So I'd like to thank you all colleagues for listening to me and uh, sorry for taking a slightly longer time. Thank you for the organizers. Thank you very much, Dr. Sentrumbe, for that uh, overview of the new items in their dental care. Uh, you'll have to think of some answers. Um, you'll have to give us a takeaway message. You'll have to look at something like uh, what are the levels of the blood cutoff when you are testing for blood sugar in the antenatal clinic. Um, some elaboration on PD and PT and the uh, doses of Jinga. Those of Jinga in mothers who have nausea and vomiting. You'll tell us more of, about this at the end of the presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have Dr. Baifa from Kulu Regional Faro Hospital, seasoned uh, clinician and uh, administrator and worker. Uh, she's going to tell us about worker perspectives on the role of postpartum family planning in during the neonatal care period. Dr. Baifa, can you join us, please? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Waswa. I would like to request the admin to share my screen, please. I failed to share it from this side. Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. I'm Dr. Baifa once again from Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. I'm going to talk about integration of uh, postpartum family planning in antenatal clinic. Um, I believe uh, when we have family planning integrated during this time of a mother's life, it is uh, much easier to, to, to accept the when we want the uh, complete package of goal-oriented antenatal care, family planning should also be part and parcel of this, this goal. Um, Gulu Regional Referral serves um, the entire Choli sub-region. Uh, we have a total of eight districts in the Choli sub-region that we oversee as Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. And uh, our total catchment population is about 1.7 million as per the last financial year, looking at the growth rates over the years. And uh, we also have a good number of refugee population at the border districts of the sub-region, about 40,000 refugees in the region. And uh, we have a total of about 300 health facilities that we oversee in the sub-region, uh, one regional referral and seven general hospitals that we directly supervise together with uh, eight health center for across the region. Um, and then also we still have a um, challenge of access to health health units by the, the general population. Only 40% of our Choli population are able to access 
health facilities due to the poor road networks in some of the areas in the sub-region. And then also uh, most of our health units are along the highways and, uh, and uh, the issues of uh, poor accessibility has remained a challenge, especially during the rainy season, like now, as we talk. And then also high levels of illiteracy and poverty has remained a challenge that affects family planning utilization, antenatal and the other services for our mother and the children. Uh, and then also the porous borders in the region at Lamo, Nuoya, Amuru districts have, have remained a challenge where we have migration like mobile communities. This has affected um, retention in care, especially when we are talking about you know, antenatal deliveries and then postnatal visits and then follow up visits for especially family planning. So we think the porous borders have affected us in a way in those border districts of Lamo, Nwoya and, and Amuro district. Um, I felt I should talk about what is going on in the Choli sub-region because I cannot only talk about Gulu Regional Referral. It will not be representative of what, what is exactly happening here. But then in the last slides, I will focus on what we are doing at Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. Our total, our total, the total fertility rate at Gulu Regional, in the Choli sub-region has been at 5.5, .5, which is about the same level with the national, the national average. So we are almost at the same level. However, we still have a high unmet need for family planning at 39%. And uh, our women of reproductive age who are not using any family planning has remained at about 70%, which still worries us. And we feel we need to have intervention that's going to increase utilization of family planning in the region. And uh, the uptake of modern methods of family planning has only been at about 30.2% in the region. And uh, I think there is more work to be done during the ANC period and even preconception period to improve this, to, to improve on utilization of family planning and to be specific modern methods of family planning. As we see the slide, uh, male, male sterilization is at 0% in the sub-region. And uh, female sterilization is also very low at only 3.6%. And the most common method that is utilized by our women of productive age has been the injectables and the implants. Uh, missed opportunities, we have, um, we have glaring missed opportunities at the immunization clinics, EPI, and natal care during labor and delivery. And, and we think, and we, we associate this due to inadequate family planning counseling early enough. And then also issues of uh, male attitudes, men's attitudes towards healthcare. There is still very low male involvement at antenatal and even generally health seeking behavior of the male has been a problem. So most commonly you find the women coming alone and yet family planning counseling is supposed to involve both partners for better uptake. Next slide. Next slide, admin, okay. Um, this slide is looking at um, our uptake of postpartum family planning in the last six months from January to June 2020. Uh, we see a general increase in uptake of family planning by about 27% between January and May 2020. And the, the other graph on the left side is looking at the method mix. So we try to disaggregate these users per method. So as we can still see, the injectables and the implants are the most commonly used methods across the sub-region in the last six months. And uh, the male sterilization is still a gap that I think we need to do something about to ensure that uh, it is also used, though it, it remains a general problem countrywide. Um, in the next slide, to achieve this general increase between uh, January to, to May, so much has been done to see that utilization has increased. Um, in January, regionally with this,
with the support of Thai plus other partners that are supporting us in health, we see that uh, we're able to have on-site mentorships of healthcare workers, but uh, this did not yield so much because you, you find that trainings have been done for a good number of midwives across the facilities, but then we kept on asking ourselves, why are they not integrating family planning in ANC to improve uptake during the postpartum period? And then uh, we also had provision of some family planning guidelines and IEC materials across the health facilities. However, these have still been inadequate. That's why the, the, the overall improvement has not been so much. So we still feel this is a gap that can be fixed. Um, the integration of postpartum family planning counseling at ANC has been one of the interventions that we have tried to put in place with the support of partners. But it is still something which I think midwives feel it's priority to talk about. That's what I would think. And you'll find that the health education talks at Antenato Clinic is focusing more on uh, danger signs during pregnancy, birth preparedness and all. So you'll find family planning is bottom on the list of topics we talk about. On April 2020, this, this year, we were able to introduce the new guidelines with the uh, support of uh, our partners, right, North actually, and then also um, mentoring the records assistants and the other healthcare workers on use of the 2019 HMIS tools. And we have seen a great improvement in the absolute numbers of women using family planning. So we think there was, we had some documentation issues that could have caused the low, you know, levels of utilization of family planning. So we think there was, we had a lot of work being done, but then we did not document them. So we believe that orientation of health workers on the new HMIS tools has been able to help us capture this information rightly in the right sections of the HMIS reports that we submit. Um, okay, next slide. The next slide is looking at uh, Gulu Regional Referral and focusing on Gulu. Um, the uptake of general family planning in Gulu Regional Referral, it is not very different from the regional picture as we see. The most common, the most commonly used method still remains uh, the injectable depot and then the implants. So uh, male sterilization, I think we, we had only one case in the whole financial year. So. I think um, the picture at Gulu Regional Referral is not far from what is happening in the entire sub-region. And uh, postpartum family planning uptake is showed in the uh, other graph on the left side. Uh, looking, okay, this, this focuses on uh, family planning utilization during the postpartum period up to six months postpartum. So the, the absolute family low. And uh, when we look at the next slide, the next slide is looking at the missed opportunities. Uh, next slide, admin. The next slide is looking at uh, the missed opportunities for postpartum family planning in Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. Uh, one of the opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, is antenatal clinic. In Gulu Regional Referral, we see an average of 70 to 80 mothers in a day who come for antenatal clinic. So we think it's an avenue to introduce family planning counseling early so that by the postpartum period, the mother has internalized the information from the health worker, they have discussed with the partner, and they have reached a decision on what they would love to have when the time comes in the postpartum period. And so we are seeing a good number of mothers are presenting at ANC. And at delivery also, we, we see that uh, we, are, we have about uh, 350 to 400 deliveries in a month at the hospital. So this is another avenue very good audience to to have family planning counseling however we still think when we talk about family planning when a mother has reported in labor it may not be understood <laughs> very well because as we know labor you know the, the, the woman is not in her right state of mind to make a decision that i want maybe a postpartum iud so that still takes us back to utilizing the avenue at antenatal care and um our 
postnatal attendance in, in the hospital is still much lower than the number of deliveries we are having at the hospital. So we see that um, the time when we are supposed to introduce the family planning method for these mothers, turn up has remained low at postnatal care. However, the few that come as a hospital, we have tried to see how we can capture the majority of the few that are returning for postnatal care. And uh, the, the other part of the slide is looking at, uh, you know, uptake generally. So as you see, the mothers who are utilizing family planning methods from postnatal clinic is uh, about 50% of them. And so that tells me that I think there is, there is something that we are, are doing to be able to capture the majority of the few that are coming for postnatal mm -hmm. care. So, um, so the tested changes that we have tried to put in place as Gulu Regional Referral, one of them is integrating postpartum family planning counseling in our health education talks at antenatal care clinic at uh, YCC, at uh, the, the postnatal clinic itself, and then also in the maternity ward, especially in the postnatal ward. It's a bit hard to have this in the labor suite. So we, we have made sure there is at least a topic on family planning at all the service delivery points in the health education schedule on a, on a monthly. And then the other change that we've been able to put in place is to, okay, we had midwives trained on family planning in 2018. We had a, a total of about 10 midwives who were trained, and these 10 were picked from all the sub family planning service delivery points. There's someone from Art Clinic, someone from Antineto, from YCC that was a participant, from Family Planning Clinic itself mm -hmm. that was a participant, and then Gain Clinic and uh, the the maternity unit of the hospital. So basic training was given to the healthcare workers and we expected uh, ongoing CPD on family planning. Then the other best practice that we've had in the hospital. Uh, our labor suit has got a corner, has got a family planning corner where you have methods there, especially the PPIUD. And then also when you go to our guide ward of the hospital, there is a corner for family planning, and uh, we've also provided a family planning register in the Gain Ward, and this was focused on getting the postabotal mothers to, to, to you know, take up postabotal family planning. And I'm happy to say that uh, this register is being utilized well under the supervision of the family planning clinic in charge. And uh, to also correct the problem of missed data, lost data, like we do so much as health workers and document less, we've been able to ensure that uh, the head of the family planning unit collects data on a weekly basis from, from the Gain Clinic and the art, Gain Clinic, Art Clinic and the labor suit itself to feed her, her reports in the main family planning clinic. And then the other opportunity that we have utilized in the hospital is uh, having the family planning clinic annexed to the postnatal clinic. So they have a common waiting area. So the mothers who have come for family planning and those who have come to immunize their children have the same waiting area. So the health education talks is, inter is integrated for to cover both both sections of mothers because they both benefit from family planning as a service. So we think this is a good opportunity for us. And then also um, mentorship on the new family planning register has been done among the other HMIS tools of 2019. So utilization has improved and, and that's what I think is one of the contributors to our improved figures on utilization of family planning since we are not missing any data Ah, next, okay. Um, despite all this we are trying to do in Gulu Regional Faro to improve utilization of postpartum family planning, we still have challenges facing its implementation. One of them is inadequate capacity of health workers to provide family planning services. 
So um, we are looking at uh, the, the long-acting reversible methods. It is still not all midwives are, are able to insert the IUD up to date. Not all midwives can insert the implant. So I think there is need to have ongoing training and uh, another set of trainings to cover those who miss that. And then we also have intern doctors, new doctors on board, new midwives on board. These have not had this training. So I think these refreshers will be able to, to cover these other lot of healthcare workers who have joined the system in Gulu. Uh, the other missed opportunities that we have are the interns. I think the interns, they know so much about family planning. They know the theoretical aspect of family planning and antenatal care. However, the interns are not able to rotate in this clinic in the maternity this lot of MOs, you know, such skill and expertise to implement family planning. And then low staffing levels have been a general problem in the hospital. Uh, for example, as I talk now, our family planning clinic of Gulu Regional Faro has only two midwives who are supposed to serve an average of about 20 to 30 mothers in a day. I, and then they're supposed to, to implement the method and then also educate the mothers. I think it is uh, a lot of workload for only two midwives in the unit. And we have the PPIUDs in the labor suit, but uh, every duty in the labor suit has only got two midwives who have to take care of the entire unit of, of you know, MFM in the hospital. And yet they have to give treatment, monitor mothers in labor, you know, capture data and all that. So I think the, the low staffing levels affect family planning counseling, even when the mothers have reported with ailments in that natal ward of the hospital. Uh, shortage of equipment has remained an issue. Uh, this is more on the supplies of speculums, disposable speculums, among others. Um, cultural beliefs have, have remained a barrier. Mothers can be given information in antenatal clinic on family planning. However, they have some beliefs they come with which is a little difficult to undo. So uh, one example is um, most mothers in actually subregion believe when you have an implant and it gets lost in the, you know, sub, <laughs> and gets lost in the, in the, in the subcutaneous to go and pierce her heart. You know, such a misconception is a little difficult to undo. But I think uh, there's a lot of work being done by midwives. And then also we have um, frequent stock out of family planning commodities, especially the depot and the implants, which are the most utilized in the hospital. And have, I'm happy that uh, there is a good linkage between the regional referral and the DHO's office, so redistribution has been done to cover shortages in the high volume facilities like Gulu Regional Referral Hospital. The other challenge that I see is uh, we have a weak linkage between the, the PNFP, especially the Catholic based facilities and government units. Uh, a case in point, I think to be more, more specific, um, St. Mary's Hospital at Cho handles a very big number of uh, antenatal care mothers and also mothers coming in labor and delivery. However, I think being a, a Catholic-based hospital, modern method is not practiced there. So I think that is a missed opportunity, which can only be solved if we have a good linkage between La Cho and the government units around it and good regional referral hospital to refer these mothers to access modern methods. Um, and then there is little or inadequate funding allocated to support family planning activities. It looks like an orphan among MCH services provided. Family planning looks like uh, very few partners want to venture into family planning because of the low chances of achieving the results that they may want to achieve. So it, it, it remains an underfunded priority in MCH. Um, then insufficient IEC materials. We have some that rights reproductive health Uganda PSI has, has, has been able to, to 
supply us with in the subregion and the hospital. However, they remain inadequate. And then also the other challenge is that they have not been translated in actually the most commonly understood language in the hospital and in the rest of the subregion. So looking at these challenges, how can we make it better? How can we make our interventions in the hospital and the subregion better to improve integration of family planning at antenatal and, the, and, and uh, eventual utilization in the postpartum period? I'm going to, to focus my improvement strategies more on the three main missed opportunities, antenatal clinic, and then at the... Uh, from the natal clinic, EPI, and then also where the mothers come from, from the community. So we, we shall focus on community, antenatal, and YCC. So I think we need to strengthen quality. To, we need to strengthen quality of counseling at antenatal clinic since we are looking at a good number of pregnant women coming for ANC. Uh, so if, how do we strengthen quality of family planning, counseling at antenatal? We need to include it and make Dr. it a, a priority to, also. Dr. Baifa, Dr. Baifa, yes, please. You need to start yes, summarizing yes. now. We are running short of time. Okay. This is my last slide. Uh, so we need to strengthen the quality of family planning, counseling at ANC and the immediate postpartum period. And then we need to have uh, targeted uh, discussion with men to improve male involvement in ANC since uptake needs partner involvement. And then also we need to have QI projects that are targeting utilization of family planning at facility level. And then community engagement remains key. How do we utilize the VHTs to, to help with a house to house sensitive on, on family health, especially to cover the new ones on board. And then we plan to strengthen linkage between St. Mary's Hospital at Cho and Gulu Regional Faros and the other health center trees. Yeah, thank you. That ends my presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bai, for sharing with us uh, your experiences in Gulu Regional Faro Hospital. Thank you very much, and for this you join us. Um, since we've, we've come to the end of the presentations, now come to the part of our discussion. I'd like to start with Dr. Michael Kawoya. We've not heard from you. There is a question for, from your presentation. What do you mean by limited ultrasound services? And I uh, would like you to give us some takeaway messages from this presentation and from this meeting. Dr. Kawoya. Please unmute yourself and talk to us. What Dr. Kawaya is finding his microphone? Dr. Way, there were some questions that were directed to your presentation. Dr. Kawaya, you're on? Oh, thank you, Dr. Kawaya. Go ahead, Dr. Kawaya. Okay, sorry, I, I, I missed a question. Yeah, there was a question that yes, what do you mean by limited ultrasound services? And okay. uh, the other thing that I'd like you to take on is uh, give us some takeaway messages what little care and ultrasound for us is from this presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much. We by a limited obstetrical ultrasound, we mean ultrasound which is basic and which is aimed at finding out um, conditions which put the mother at risk. And this may include, among others, uh, multiple pregnancy, uh, they may also include placenta previa. Uh, they may also uh, uh, include gross uh, fetal abnormalities. Um, so th that's what we mean. And also limited means that they should also be able to do some uh, limited uh, biometric measurements like uh, bipyretal diameter and femoral length, at least to date, 
uh, the fetus. Hello. Your takeaway message, what should we take from this message? From this meeting? Uh, pardon? What is your takeaway message as far as that person is concerned for antenatal care from this yes. message? Yes. Our aim should be that at least every mother gets an ultrasound during pregnancy which is integrated with uh, the antenatal care at least uh, one ultrasound before 20 weeks because uh, that would um, uh, help us to do many things. One, to see is this mother at risk. It would also help us to date the fetus and also to note any other abnormalities which may interfere with the normal delivery. So um, at least let's see that every mother gets one ultrasound scan during pregnancy before 20 weeks. And I think with that also goes with training because our aim should be that every midwife, at least registered midwife, has these limited obstacle ultrasound skills and that there is an ultrasound uh, at all um, uh, levels uh, that would be right from health center three, four upwards, where mothers go for antenatal ultrasound so that they don't have to move distances. In other words, make it as accessible as possible through training uh, every midwife, uh, equipping them with these skills. And this, I think, has to be done during their training in midwifery or very soon after. Uh, thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Kawoya. Over to you. Over. Uh, Dr. Sintumwe, there are some questions which are directed towards you. I would like you to take a pen and be ready to take them on. Are you ready, Dr. Sintumwe? Yes. Okay. Um, you want to think about your takeaway message for the new... Uh, proposals for the new antenatal care. Okay, then uh, what is the cut of blood sugar to make a diagnosis of gestational diabetes? Okay, the other one was elaborate more about between TD and TT. What are the max? What is the maximum dose of TD? How many doses per TD? And is it necessary to get a booster dose if somebody has completed all the doses? Uh, the third one was, uh, what are the strategies to improve, to move from four visits to eight contacts in antenatal care? Doctor, have you got those? Uh, yes, I think uh, if I had well, there was an interesting one where there was doses of ginger, for sure, yes. I don't know what I think. <laughs> uh, that must have been, it must be that it varies with different people as long as they don't take uh, a, a nexus, a heavy amount, which may also lead to other things. So I think it context is specific as usual according to who this person is, but advise not to take in a um, 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 copious amount. Eh? Of course, the others were chamomile things, which we don't have, vitamin B6, which is given, I think, often eh? in Uganda, plus all its other combinations. Um, the other one was about the TD, the, the tetanus toxoid alone, which we've been giving, but I think the Ministry of Health has now adapted the, the tetanus toxoid and the reduced diphtheria toxoid vaccine, which I think they are giving us 0 0.5 mils. Whichever, I, I'm not sure whether, which one they have, but it's given. You see, there are some variants in what, who, who manufactured it. 
in what the real milligrams, micrograms content is. But the important thing is that there are two doses. Dose one is given in early pregnancy, and the second dose is given after four weeks of TB1. Mm, when we get a detailed presentation about vaccines in pregnancy, they'll even talk more. So I think we'll give, I think it's within the next series of webinar when we are going to discuss a lot of detail of these new specific interventions by the related specific units of the Ministry of Health. As for this uh, diabetes in pregnancy, it's common in uh, women above 45 there. And uh, well, we should watch out for their presentations, uh, which may indicate diabetes. And I think the, 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 the HbA1c, if you automatically take it, and it is greater than 6.5, that measure of your glycosylated hemoglobin, uh, how you have controlled it within three months. If you just take it random and it is giving you greater than 6.5, then it is going to be that. You must begin to say this is DM in pregnancy. And then there is this fasting blood sugar of greater than 126 milligrams a day. And uh, of course, if you give, you, you try to give this uh, group call during pregnancy and you take your measures after two hours, then if it exceeds 200 milligrams per deciliter, then there is a problem. So the, the, I think those are the issues for diagnosing diabetes in pregnancy. And what's our takeaway? I think we now are required once again as health workers to really be oriented, mentored again for some of these new uh, changing things, which are now real recommendations. We need to ensure that there's capacity building, but also that what it takes in the health system improvement is done because if you talk about these uh, glucose things and uh, isolated things it's not easy for many of the health units we have even a simple hb sometimes becomes difficult so we have we work, work to do a lot of work to improve the content of what we provide through improving the health system's needs uh, otherwise it becomes difficult to implement the recommended uh, guidelines under each of those areas. So I think it's more work for us. Thank you, Dr. Sintungwe. Uh, it's now time to ask for us some questions. I have uh, Dr. Uh, Christine Nakumu with a hand up. Dr. Christine, please unmute yourself, ask your question, be brief and specific and then mute yourself again. Thank you. Uh, we uh, seem to have lost Christine. Uh, any other hand up, please? Any other questions that we need to answer? Or yes, Chair. For... Yes, Moses. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and all for the presenters, I think uh, uh, they have done a good job. I think I have a few issues for Dr. Kawoya. I think over the last quite a number of months now have happened. On, in, on, in social media, we have seen a lot of uh, ult ultrasound results saturated and the general population has been laughing at those results. Uh, if you take it from a social media perspective, that is something to laugh about. But I think for us, uh, the health workers, 
it is something that is treating the image of the profession and it points to the quality assurance gaps that might exist within the healthcare system. I know the task shifting of the ultrasound function to the local staff. Uh, I would love maybe to hear more, what are some of the quality assurance measures or mechanisms in place, either by the training institutions to ensure that the people they have trained that have gone through the system are getting supported while they are in the field, but there is also a system for support supervision and go ongoing mentoring of those teams to ensure that they are sticking to what they learned. And on a related thing, also related point, is the fact that you realized many of the, their graduates, when they get to the field, they get transferred in the district. I've worked at a decentralized level, and you realize that sometimes you have uncoordinated transfers of staff within the districts without paying uh, particular attention to the skills of certain health workers that they might have. You might have a midwife that has skills in ultrasound and they are doing it quite well. And then they get transferred to another health facility without an ultrasound machine. I don't know what they are trying to do in terms of engaging the district leadership also to focus on, um, to have, uh, to ensure uh, equitable distribution of the skills, but also to have to pay attention to goals during the transfers. Over to you, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, I, it all boils down to quality and quality assurance. And um, with quality assurance goes also regulation, not only training, but also regulation. And also um, it's important that we constantly uh, keep, uh, do, do uh, uh, we will constantly uh, update the skills of these people. Um, you may notice, and I don't know if you, the majority of the people who do scans in this country are actually not trained and not certified. But up to now, there has not been a mechanism for regulating and for enforcing uh, some uh, of these recommendations. And I think we have to tighten that regulation aspect whereby facilities are inspected and people are required to show their certification and not only that also to show CME, evidence of CME that they have been doing continuing medical education because we know that with time and knowledge and even skills are uh, deteriorate. Uh, we also have to, to, to make sure that these people get uh, routine CME, uh, not only theory, but also are brought back. But this is also because um, it, it, it should be the people who are in charge of, uh, who are employing these people, that they should also prompt us that, yes, I think there are some skills gaps here which need to be addressed. So it's a two-way system. For us, we are the trainers, but also the regulators and the ones who are also employing these people who need to work together to ensure that the skills are maintained and also that only those people who are licensed, uh, who are certified, actually do practice and they practice within scope of their competences. Because quite often people uh, practice outside their competences. And so that supervision at that local level ensures that people are working within their competences and they're not required or they're, they're not actually forced to practice behind, I mean, above their competences. Now, uh, with regard to equipment and making sure that facilities have equipment and that uh, everybody has access uh, to an ultrasound unit, this is also something we'd have to do a coordination with the Ministry of Health to ensure that at least uh, the uh, uh, as ultrasound facilities are accessible uh, by those who need them. This also goes along with repairing and maintaining the equipment 
which are already there. So um, there are many notes to be tied. It's not just one, but I think we need perhaps maybe a national um, uh, task force to see how we can really get all these things tied together. So it's not a problem of training. It goes beyond the training. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kawoya. Um, Agnes Chirikumu, you had a question, your hand up. Could you please unmute yourself? Give your question specifically, and not a lecture, and then let's have it answered. No, it wasn't a question. I think the mic just raised the hand. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Apio Jennifer, your question, please. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, hey, Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Pio, an intern midwife. I had a concern uh, about the obstetric ultrasound, as previously ex uh, discussed, that at least every mother should have the first ANC, the, the first ultrasound done before 28 weeks. But what I've been seeing through this time that I've been in Antinendo, I've realized most mothers, when, even if you request them to do the ultrasound earlier, they tend to do it at a later time. So would that, that they do at a later time have, have any, 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 any concern or it's just a routine that the mother has to do before 20, 20 weeks? So in case a mother comes above 28 weeks, 20, 20 weeks, should we, will it still be relevant for her to do the scan? That is my question. Thank you. Dr. Kawoya and your team, please. Oh, okay. Yeah, we know that the earlier the ultrasound scan is done, the more accurate the dating. Not only that, also the more accurate you'll be able to, to see, uh, for instance, multiple pregnancy and also the coronary um, um, uh, of, of the pregnancy. Uh, and so uh, many of these things which show up are easier seen when the abdomen, when the, when the, when the, when the uh, uterus is not so distended. Um, and, 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 and of course, if that mother is dated early, that is the date which is going to be accurate throughout the whole scan. And so it's important for dating purposes, for detection of multiple pregnancy, and also for other gross abnormalities, that this is done early enough. And besides, if there is a need for termination, the, the older the pregnancy is, the more the complications for um, a termination of pregnancy, resulting from termination of pregnancy. So those, among other reasons, um, is why we should scan as early as possible. Thank you, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kawoya. Uh, um, we have Dr. S well, Susan Ludigo on the, with the reason. Please, Susan, unmute yourself. Give your question and mute yourself again. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Kawoya. I wanted also to learn something on why we do the scan as early as before 28 weeks of gestation. Uh, we want also to confirm pregnancy because most times you see that uh, there are some abnormalities that can come up, show signs of pregnancy, but yet there is no proof for pregnancy. So one of those things that confirm pregnancy and also viability to look at this pregnancy, how it see settling itself there, and get, uh, uh, actually settling itself there. So I wanted also to add on those two so that the midwife can know the essence of why we do it as early as that. Back to you, the chairperson. Thank you so much. Thank you for that compliment. Bernard uh, Mwesija, you have your hand up. Please be specific and then mute yourself afterwards. Uh, yes, my question uh -huh. is on the eight visits for Antinento. Uh, currently, from the time it was uh, in, initiated, we are seeing uh, that most of the 
through most of the facilities none of many few of them have actually had mothers reaching up to the aid visit i don't know if there is any any person who has any success stories on what they how they have, they have been able to implement this uh given the workload that most of the midwives are always uh, talking about the same i think uh, concerns with the postpartum family planning what are the success stories on uh, having this uh, implemented uh to the eight visits the um dr sentumbe do you have a, uh, an answer to that how do we implement the eight visits uh, strategy now what are the news what are the strategies for implementing the eight visits i think uh, as we started we said that this is now evidence-based practice which means that a lot of research has been done comparing to what we have comfortably been doing for visits, but even for Uganda, for visits has been very hard. However, WHO never stops to give guidance on what is best for any person, whether you have diabetes, malaria, whatever it will come out and say, after looking at all this data coming available, reviewing what was there before, what is now, this is what it is. And it is going to be very important that people know that the more contacts, and that's why they've even changed them from visits, as it may imply, it is just going to antenatal. The word contact refers to a real systems interface. You've interfaced with a health worker, who is properly trained on the what and the how and the where and she or he has grasped why it must change so it is shown now that the more contacts you make with your health worker if they are really doing quality anc not just saying next next and then okay you go today there is not this there is not that if you give the total package, and that is the word used, then the mother and the fetus are likely to benefit from all those classes of recommendation. The promotion, the preventive, the treatment, the managing their different, different uh, complaints. You get out more. But this is no joke for feeble health, facility, health systems. That is why they said, and that's why the guideline says, we must be prepared to address the health system's challenges, the numbers of health workers, how much have you trained them? Where are the commodities you're talking about today? Even iron and folic acid is 10 tablets per woman. HB, hmm. So, Urine, even dipstick, it requires, and I said it is hard work now. It is challenging to the system, but this is what is going to give you the best results. It is different when you think about the good results from the, for the woman and the child. And when for you, you have to offer ANC anyway, whatever quality, because of what you have. So those are the considerations to make at the district level, therefore, but I think let's begin with the national level. We must now relook and calculate what it will take us to look after one million mothers and more per year if we are to offer these guidelines. We'll have to slowly go into that mathematics, but we remember that even with the four visits, we hadn't yet gone that far. But if we are going to implement those recommendations, we will start at the national level to say what does it take to make sure that every man can receive two doses of TD. What will it take to make sure that every woman gets an ultrasound scan done hmm? in the early pregnancy, 24, 28 weeks? What will it take? Really at the community level, at the health facility level, 
those are deep considerations for our health systems. And Thank then, you very much. yeah, and even the health facility has to ask what changes are we going to make? The district health management team was also given a number of uh, re responsibilities. Supervision, are you making sure you're recruiting? Are you not recruiting and getting away people from where they were? All those sort of things we now have to come down and say, this is what we are changing and we are trying to measure what we are doing. And we know that if we're not doing well here, we must improve here. And uh, therefore the quality improvement processes now must be implemented much more than before. Because in the recent past, we've been talking about quality of care improvement in during the time of childbirth, 24 hours. We are saying it's a continuum of care to be improved right from when I'm pregnant. Thank you, Thank you much, uh, Centube, for those words. It is very clear that we are not yet there. We need there's a lot of work to do, a lot of recruitment to do, a lot of sensitization to do, and then we need to have attitude change. Uh, we shall have just two more comments, Dr. Andiwalana Richard and Dr. Baifa, and then we shall ask Dr. Richard Kajimu to give us uh, announcements, and then we we'll close this uh, webinar. Dr. Richard Andiwalana. Yes, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, the presenters. Uh, my, my, my highlight goes to the um, uh, diagnosing uh, gestational diabetes mellitus. Uh, you realize that the prevalence of um, anemia and pregnancy is high. And you, uh, if you use the um, HbA1c in anemic mothers, the figures would be skewed, uh, the 6.5. So I already see that what, what can come out to, for that we diagnose accurate diabetes, gestational diabetes mellitus. Because you see mothers come in and they have uh, one test done, maybe a random blood sugar, which maybe they have taken a, a good carbohydrate meal and you find it's maybe 7.1 and people don't bother, maybe it's uh, 6.8 there. Okay, so I believe are, it are right. Right short of yeah. Okay, thank you very much. But that, that is, that was, I wanted to say what best can come out of the screening for gestation diabetes mellitus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Baifa, your last comments and we'll close. Thank you very much, Dr. Waswa. I would like to to respond on the issue of how do we achieve problem has been in a mother starting at natal care late. So how in Karamoji did a health education at the general OPD you realize that are very many young women of childbearing age come to the general OPD with other complaints. It may not be pregnancy. So, I, so they decided to introduce menstrual history taking in general OPD and also health education in OPD. They were able to fish a very good number of women with early pregnancy and link them to antenatal. So I think that could work to achieve the four or the eight visits. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there are two, say, some things that have come out. Two scans per visit with basic skills, eight contacts, D TD, and we must include family planning information during the NATO visits, and we must use quality improvement to get these things done. Uh, Richard Kajimu, please give us announcements and we close this webinar. Uh, just Dr. Waswa to say, that our colleague uh, very rightfully said context specific, but also important to realize that these uh, uh, three possible things which you can do are also context specific. The HbA1c, absolutely we can do that. Mm, you can do a fasting plasma glucose. You can do the two hour plasma glucose after you have challenged with the glyco. Uh, however, having said that, we need now to say, okay, 
let us Uganda, since we have a prevalence of anemia in so many, do some uh, implementation research in relation to the three recommended diagnostic criteria. And we see what comes out with our anemic women. Anyway, how many are they? And where are they? So a lot of, yeah, implementation research to find out what is where and what Thank can Uganda say. Mm -hmm. We shall uh, forward that idea to the Safe Motherhood Committee and we'll see how we can implement that. Um, uh, Dr. Kaju, please, announcements and we close this webinar. I think we're getting late. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Waswam, uh, for moderating this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, our presenters, who have uh, labored to uh, expound on the topics. Uh, I want to just make three announcements that uh, these uh, webinars on safe motherhood, especially focusing on antenatal care in this period, shall continue up to throughout September on every Monday. So next Monday on uh, it will be, I think, 5th September. We'll be having our next webinar around antenatal care and we shall be focusing on uh... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear, we can hear you. Yes, on Monday 7th, Monday 7th of uh, September, we'll be focusing on priority interventions to increase coverage of antenatal care services. Uh, we are going to have topics uh, around group A and C, and we shall here have an international experience as well as a national experience of uh, implementing group A and C. We'll have a session on community interventions and task shifting, things that uh, Dr. Oliver has highlighted, and we'll have both an experience from Malawi and an experience from uh, the Eastern region here in Uganda. We we'll also have a topic, uh, a session on male involvement, uh, shared by uh, one of the very vocal and experienced person around uh, championing male involvement, which has also come out in this webinar. So or subsequently, we'll have other webinars and we'll be communicating uh, through the emails. Please watch out. If you registered and uh, selected all the webinars, then you do not have to register again for the next webinars. You just have to come back to the link and join on Monday. But if you selected only today's webinar, please, you need to go back and register for the second webinar, which will be on Monday, 7th September. Again, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the National Safe Motherhood Committee, uh, thank you very much and have a good day. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kajimu. Only remember to send all these, all these persons who have attended to the, the, the registrar, Uganda Medical and Dental Practitioners Council, and all the other councils for CPD points. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Please. Thank you for attending. Bye and thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye. thank you so much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Olive. Bye, thank you, everyone. Bye, Prof. Bye-bye, <laughs> Richard and Brooke. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Bye. It's a rose and walk out. That didn't become it. Um, you must do with him. You can do it. You must be around. You don't look like that.
He, normally, if he's going away for good, unless he gets diverted and he walks out, he normally says, if people see you tomorrow, then he goes. Please mute your microphone. <laughs> 